I, I made the plan there and came on, and I, I was trying to back out there a minute ago and, and uh, think about this thing because I certainly like to practice. Um, I, I appreciate hospitality, and I like to practice the same uh, and reciprocate those things. And I, I, I do pray for Brother Arley, anybody that pastors uh, Brother Jim over there, Needs the patience of Job. <laughs> I think my brother Jim, he and I, he and I are good friends. Uh, in fact, we still mess with each other by text message sometimes. We cut up a little bit there now and then. They've been dear friends and were members of the church when I was pastoring up here. And a few other folks, a little entourage that came out, were foolish enough to come out and try to hear me preach. And, AJ, you made it, buddy. Uh, you can holler. Good to see you, dear folks, as well. And I uh, appreciate some friends coming out to support us tonight and be part of it. We are engaged in a ministry called CPR, and I, I think I presented it here before, but just a quick break of view is that um, 4,000 churches in the United States were closed this year. Out of that number, about 950 of them are Baptist churches, and out of that number, about 360 of them are independent Baptist churches. Uh, on average, that would mean that we're having about one church closed every day in the United States. 360 to 70 of them, and uh, one, one church closed, the Independent Baptist Church closed every day. Many of the churches that we go in are, uh, I would say, less than 10 years away from extinction. Uh, when you've only got eight or 10 people in the church, and I'm 62, and I'm the youngest person there, I'm one of the youngest people there, my wife and I, and so that's that's not good. And so we're engaged in a ministry that we hope is, is going to revitalize churches and we certainly work to that end. We do a lot of Sunday school leadership things. We come in and do uh, try to help churches get their Sunday school growing. I believe Sunday school is an excellent way to grow a church. People say, well, that's a plan that doesn't work anymore. I think it's a plan that we're not working anymore like we should. And so uh, we do that. We spend a lot of time in that, that area of ministry. We'll be doing our 50th uh, full Sunday school workshop. We do a lot of short abbreviated ones around, but we'll be doing one in Tumble, Wisconsin in September. Uh, we did come, just come from Wisconsin. I did a BBS for a church plant in northern Wisconsin, and I was a youth pastor for 23 years, and that's how that happened. <laughs> um, I still have nightmares. <laughs> uh, I, had, I had some kids in my youth group. I wanted to kill them and tell God it was suicide. <laughs> He said, Lord, I want to walk with you. 
I want to be close to you. I think that's one of the great things that's missing today in Christianity and modern day Christendom is that desire and that longing to truly walk with God. Uh, David said, put it this way in Psalm 42, in verse 1, he said, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. I don't find that among God's people like I, I really think we should be in the day that we live. I also see some leading in this passage of Scripture. Jesus answered to this longing of this man. He said, go home to thy friends and tell them. I believe that's a great commission in a nutshell. He says, go home and tell them. You go and tell someone. Uh, go and share what I've done with you. If I believe the key to an intimate life with the Lord Jesus Christ is having a heart for people that are truly in need of the gospel. I like, I like knocking on doors, and I'm glad that we do that. But I believe that one of the things that's greatly missing is, is personal evangelism at the personal level, where we get concerned about the people that we love and the people that we are uh, live near us, people within our family, and we influence them for the cause of Christ. A third thing I find there is living. And he departed and began to publish. No questions asked, just obedience. Just, Lord, if that's what you want, and if that's the thing that you say is important, and the thing that you say is critical, then Lord, I'm certainly going to step right up and do that very thing. Uh, it's very difficult these days to get new converts to come to maturity in Christ. We're just distracted, and we've got so many things going on in our world in these days, and we just don't seem to follow through on our growth uh, in, in things. And uh, we, I mean, too many believers today, even long-term believers, are living in what I call Christian mediocrity. Uh, they're content to simply kind of drift the law, and they're not really seeing a lot of growth in their life, and they've been pretty much where they are, and they're walking with God for many years. And I just call it Christian mediocrity. But notice those two phrases that we singled out tonight, great things and did marvel. Wherever the Lord Jesus Christ went, he performed miracles. He transformed lives. He changed people. Uh, the Gospels, in fact, are only a sampling of the miracles that the Lord Jesus performed. In fact, in John chapter 21 and verse 25, uh, John put it this way, there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, every one, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Uh, in other words, the, the Gospels are simply a sample. Uh, it's not everything. It's not a complete catalog of all that Jesus did. I believe that there were literally thousands of people that Jesus healed and that he transformed their lives and families that he helped and amazing things that he did. And Mark chapter 5 gives us a, a sampling of three of those miracles that took place. The first is the maniac of Gadara that was free from a legion of demons. I once preached a message to our teenagers years ago called a crude dude in the nude uh, about this passage of scripture there. God took this maniacal, naked, savage of a man and set him clothed and in his right mind and just longing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the Lord Jesus had the power to free people from the power of sin and Satan. And then there's a woman earlier in the chapter, they had an issue of blood. And in a simple act of faith, this woman touched the hem of Jesus' garment and was made whole. She was delivered from something, a malady that had bothered her for many years of her life, and suddenly she was free from pain and misery. See, the Lord Jesus could free men from the power of sickness as well. And then there was Jairus' daughter that was raised literally from the dead. An amazing miracle that Jesus did Here's a man that desperately needed help for his little girl. There's some, maybe some of you, uh, and you say, Preacher, I've got a daughter, or I've got a son, or I've got an offspring, a child, and I desperately need some spiritual help for them tonight. I'd sure like to see them. They're dead in trespasses and sin, and I'd sure like to see them born again to new life in Christ. And so he needed help for his little girl, and Jesus proved something. He proved that he could free men from the power of the sepulchre. See, uh, when people encounter, encounter the Lord Jesus Christ, great things happen. Amen. Amazing things took place there. Lives were salvaged. Families were helped. People found hope that had no hope before. And it was so everywhere that the Lord Jesus went. 
It was a pattern of his ministry here on this earth. This is, and it, this is the same Jesus that we serve today. This is the same Lord that you and I serve. The Lord Jesus Christ that is a miracle working uh, God. A God that does great things. Perhaps in a different way in things today that we don't have the, the sign gifts that we had during Bible times and those things. But yet still a God that does great things there. He's still able to transform lives. Amen. He's still able for people to come down to the old fashioned altar and find conversion by hope in Jesus Christ and their lives be transformed. He's still able to take an old drunk and save him from the guttermost to the uttermost. Amen. Amen. He's still able to do those things. He's still able when God's people get on their faces and begin to pray and seek the face of God. He still answers prayer. He still does those things. Great things happen when Jesus shows up, Amen. when Jesus comes to town. But as we move to the next chapter and pick up some verses there, we're going to find that Jesus is coming to his hometown of Nazareth. And you and I look at that and we say, boy, he's going to be well received there. They're going to roll out the red carpet for him. They're going to host a parade. They're going to give him the key to the city. All of those things are going to take place. I'm telling you, a hometown son is coming back, the Savior, the Messiah, and they are going to really, really, I mean, this is going to be an amazing time. But look at Mark chapter 6 and verse 1. And he went out from this and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works, and look at those two words, church, mighty works. Aren't those words very similar to those words, great things? Very similar in idea and concept. Such mighty works are wrought by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Sounds like politics today. Say so amen right there. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty works. Look at those words. Now, before he was doing great things. Before there were mighty works, but now no mighty works. Say that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And... In the previous verses, Jesus marveled. Uh, excuse me, in the previous verses, the people marveled. But here in this verse, he marveled. Amen. Jesus marveled. Amen. Because of their unbelief, and he went round about the village of teaching. Now, you and I would have expected this to be the high point of Jesus' ministry. We would have expected that, that scores would have been converted, that thousands would have been healed, that revival would have swept through the city, that God would have done a, an amazing and miraculous thing in that particular place. But here the Bible says that Jesus could do no mighty works. Certainly not like the things that he had done in other places and elsewhere. Oh, he did a few things of minor significance and healed a few sick folk, but certainly nothing compared to what he had done in other locations. And certainly nothing that was worthy of the great power that he certainly had and possessed. He taught the same truth that he taught everywhere else. And perhaps with even more passion than he had at other places because after all, this was his hometown. And these were people that he knew, some of them since his childhood. And, and yet, and no doubt, he longed to do great works there. He longed to do the great things, the mighty works. And Jesus was the same. I mean, the message was the same. The life-changing power was the same. The love for souls indeed was the same. All of those the same. And yet, Nazareth was somehow different. Nobody works. Something in Nazareth, something in Nazareth restrained the Lord Jesus from exercising the power and the majesty and the ability and the help that he was exercising in other places. Something there kept him from doing the great things. 
And I wonder if there's not a message in that for us to do today because I believe that God still desires to do great things in our lives. Amen. I believe that God still desires to use us and, and that God desires to do great things in our churches. But sadly, a lot of people today that have been saved for a very long time did not really tell them anything great or any great things or any of those mighty works that God has done in their life. They relegated those things to the preachers and the missionaries and and that certain select group of Christians are, that are the ones that stand and give amazing testimonies of how the Lord is working in their lives and how God is using them to see their friends converted and, and how God is doing great things in their work. They somehow feel that those things are, are for those special people, but yet they are not related to them, that they don't live on that same plane. And yet, believe it or not, friends, you and I have the same... We have the same privilege of prayer that D.L. Moody had. Uh, he, while he was a great man of God, it was not it was not something that he had a special relationship uh, that God saw something different in him than he did in us. We can come to God and pray in the same manner, and God will answer us just as much as He will enter anyone else on this planet. And so it is that a lot of churches and a lot and a lot of churches also are operating in what I would consider the realm of mediocrity. Uh, where are the great revivals that once characterized our movement as fundamental independent Baptists? And where are the altars that are filled with those who come to what the old timers used to call the mortar stage and get down here on an old fashioned altar and, and weep over their sin and where are those where are those lost sons and daughters that some praying mom has baked the throne of God for their soul and they come running down the aisle and they're saved and, and say, thank God that somebody prayed for me. Where are those friends and neighbors and those that we've influenced and where are those people, where are the great revivals, where are the altars that are filled and why don't we turn the world upside down like they did in the book of Acts? We read how they turned the world upside down, just those few disciples in the book of Acts. And why is it that we can complain about all the things that are going on in our land and with as many believers as we have in our land, we can't turn America upside down for the cause of Christ anymore. I wonder. The book of Acts, I understand, is not a book of, it's a book of transition. And we don't get our, our church doctrine from it. But nothing in the, in the scripture forbids us from having the same devotion, the same consecration, and the same level of commitment that the people in the first century had for the Lord Jesus. I want to see God do great things in my life. Personally. Amen. I, I really want that. I remember things that I prayed, and I remember when I resigned my church over here and I went away from there. The things I remember, the three things that I prayed, and I said, God, I want to be more effective than I've ever been before in the work of ministry. I said, God, I, I desire that. I want to see you do great things in my life and in our work there. And I love to see God do great things in our churches. I love to see revival breaking out in some of our churches. I long to see the people in the pews getting on fire and pleading before God. I long to see people praying and finding that God still answers prayer and, and see them pleading for lost souls. And I, I long to see people getting engaged in and trying to win their community to Christ again. I want to see great things in our churches. I want to see the pews fill back up. I want to hear the, the clamor of little voices in Sunday school on Sunday morning that's almost deafening. I want to go around and find where kids have drawn on the walls and, and misbehaved in the church because thank God they're there. Amen. Amen. But perhaps uh, perhaps the same issues that trouble Nazareth are the same issues that are troubling us. Maybe the same thing that was wrong in Nazareth that kept Jesus from doing the mighty works and great things there are the same things that are that are that are hindering that today. I believe that Jesus could, to begin with, he could do no mighty works there because they questioned his authority. They heard his oration. They heard him preach. Jesus was teaching in the synagogue and certainly he was no ordinary preacher. Mark chapter 1 verse 22, you find that they were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. The scribes heard him or they had heard the scribes and they said, you know, uh, this man doesn't sound like a man that knows the scripture. 
We get our word author from that word authority. He said, they said, you know, this sounds like the man that wrote the scripture. He sounds like the man that wrote the Old Testament. He knows it that well. He speaks with some, he speaks with the impetus of God in, in a way that they did not actually understand. I'm not certain what Jesus preached that day, but apparently it must have cut pretty deep. It wasn't designed to make them feel good about themselves and, and feel happy about their sin. He wielded the word of God, the two-edged sword, with great power. The Old Testament scriptures, and he cut past the religion to the truth of the heart. And the Bible says they were astonished at him. In other words, that word astonished means to be stricken with a blow. Uh, can I put that in southern country lineage for you? They got knocked in the head with the truth. <laughs> they got slapped upside the head with a blow of truth. It was it was a message that that cut to the chase, that cut to the truth, and they were stricken by it. They were smitten with it. And they offered their observations. They had observed his wisdom. They said, well, what wisdom is this which is given unto him? Uh, no doubt, they, they said, there's no doubt this man is intelligent, he's well informed, he, he turns a phrase very well. They had certainly observed his works. There was no undeniable proof that, that supernatural things followed this man. The news of things he had done in other places had certainly preceded him to the village of Nazareth. It was not a secret what he had done in other places. His fame was well known. But though you and I would look and say, well, the truth here is obvious. This is the Messiah. This is the Christ. This is the one that can heal. This is the one that does great things. But they voiced their objection instead. From whence hath this man these things? In other words, where does he get this kind of authority? Again, can I put it in everyday language? What gives him the right? What is it that why can he tell us what to do and how to live or what to believe? I can remember those times as a boy when my older sister, who was older and wiser, but she was nevertheless my sister. And she was probably smarter than I was at that time. And please don't tell her that I said that. I'll never hear the last of it. <laughs> but somehow... She would tell me things and tell me to do things and, and suggest that I do things. And while I knew that she might really understand and know more than I did, it was the wrong one telling me. And I told her just exactly what you told your siblings when they tried to tell you what to do. You're not my boss. Mom didn't die and leave you in charge. And you can't tell me what to do. Okay, and I think that perhaps that's a picture of sort of what might be uh, somewhat of what might be happening here in our text tonight. Though Jesus' teaching seemed to have great wisdom to the people of Nazareth, they refused his authority. They said, uh, "You just we're not going to hear you tell us what to do here." I ask you a question tonight: Who's really in charge in your life? Who is really in authority in your life? Who's the one that calls the shots? What authority does the Holy Spirit of God have in your life when he convicts you and deals with you? What authority does the word of God have in your life when the man of God stands in the pulpit and preaches it to you? And uh, Then you kind of respond to that, well, well, that's just preacher talk. And those things are good, and I'm sure, but you know, I think God understands who I am, and I think God, you know, me and God, me and Jesus, we got this thing going, and and He understands me, and He knows my weaknesses, and all of those things. How do you respond to preaching? I think we sometimes find, instead of impact in preaching today, we find indignity more than we do impact of those that hear are hearers of the word but seem to pass it off and they taste the preaching and go home and talk about how tasty the sermon was, but they never partook of the truth that it embodied. And where is the spirit of submission and obedience to God among his people in our day? We want in our day too often, I find that God's people want a Bible of clay. 
They want a scripture, a Bible that can be that can be shaped and molded and, and pressed and conformed to fit within the framework of what they desire and what they believe and what they want and the standards that they have set or not set for themselves and and they want to fit God within to the mold of what they desire and what they want. And they, and they arrive at church knowing what they believe and saying, I know already know what I believe. I'm here to listen, but I can sort it out. And, and, and as the old, old farmer said, he said, I didn't pick the bones out. You'll just have to eat the meat and throw the bones away. And we handle the Word of God in that way. We take the meat, we treat it as a library book, and, and we check it out when we think we need it, and when we don't, we replace it in its place on the shelf and deny it the authority that it really deserves in our life. We make some areas of our life off limits. Oh God, I'll let you do that. I'll let you have authority in that area of life. Why, I'll let you have authority in this area, but Father, when it comes to this other area over here, and when it comes... To submitting in the area of personal holiness and my own personal standards, I, I, I would not I would not choose to do that, Lord. And I, I you're just going to have to understand me. Christ has certainly has a right to authority in my life, doesn't he? Amen. He has a right to authority in our lives. First Corinthians chapter six, verse nineteen through twenty says, "What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you?" which you have of God, and ye are not your own. You don't belong to yourself if you're saved. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, poor by God in your body and in your spirit, which are, which are God's. He said, listen, I, I insist on authority in your life. We belong to him by creation, but we're bought with a price. See, the Lord Jesus not only wants to be your Savior, he truly wants to be your Lord. Is what he meant. And yet God will never force that on you. God will never put your hand behind your back like we did when I was a kid and twist that arm and say, say uncle, get into my will. Get into the things that I desire. Now I will say this, God knows how to chasten us. He knows how to skin us when we need it. And God has done that to me. And if you've been saved very long, He's, if you're a child, you're a child of God, and you've been disobedient a few times, and God stood stick to you right. and straightened you out very good. Amen. And yet, He never forces things on us. We always have that choice. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present right. your bodies, a living right. sacrifice. Right. God doesn't say, I'm going to force this on you. I'm going to insist on a spirit of sacrifice and surrender on your life. I'll, I'll settle for nothing less. You present your body. If you offer it and if you're willing to give that and you, God gave us a free will, a choice that we can make. We are not hyper Calvinists. Romans chapter 6 and verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are like unto dead. God says you have a choice about those things. And they claim it offended them. Doesn't that sound so much like our world today? Everyone is offended. That's right. And they come to church and they're offended. And they hear the word of God. And you've had folks come to your church here and they're offended. Oh, this church is preaching too harsh. Oh, the gospel here. I know your pastor. I know he preaches right. I, hey, I, oh, it's too harsh. Oh, he, he stepped on my toes, and I'm unhappy with that. And they were offended. That word offended is from the word scandalizo. That's an interesting word. We get our word scandal from, scandalous. And they said, we're for you to ask this level of submission, this level of our time, our talent, our treasure, our, our, our loyalties, our love, if you want for, for you to ask first place, to come to here and ask first place in our lives, that's a scandal. That's scandalous. See, understand this. Salvation will never come to you, and I, I don't know everyone here. I'd like to think everyone's saved. But understand this. Salvation will never come to you or anyone else unless you're willing to accept a very offensive viewpoint about yourself. 
that you're a sinner. You'll have to admit your sin. One of the hardest parts in getting someone to come to Christ and sharing the gospel is getting someone to understand that they are lost. Without <coughs> Satan, that they are a sinner. And you, as a child of God, once you're saved, you will never see the mighty works that God wants to do in your life. As long as you insist on a Christianity that never inconveniences you or offends you. But I've got to hurry on, not only because they question his authority, but because of their familiar association with him. He was, in their eyes, pretty ordinary. He was a hometown boy. Jesus had spent 30 years of his life there, the better part of that. They'd seen him, they knew his character, his integrity, his piety. Only the carpenter, they said, I can hear it now. I know who that is. Him and Joseph built that addition on the back of our house years ago. He was just a kid then, but he, he made a good carpet. He did real good. I wonder, I tell you what, I could give him some work while he's in town. Oh yeah, hey, listen, I got some plows. I got some plows he carved out and made for us, and I'm telling you, he really knows how to do that. He did well. We're still using those things. I know Jesus. He's the carpenter. Oh, uh, that's the in that in that Mary's boy. And that was not a statement of of respect. It was a state. It was a derogatory statement. What they were saying is, isn't that the illegitimate child that Mary was expecting whenever she met Joseph? Isn't that that son of her ill, sinful living? We played with him as a child. I remember Jesus and I, we played together out in the streets when we were boys. I remember who that is. Why? Oh yeah, he played with my kids. They played stickball out here in the streets. I know who that is. That's Jesus right there. See, Christ, Christ was known to them, but he was not known in a very special way. There was no splendor in the way that they knew him. When D.L. Moody and Iris Sankey were conducting evangelistic crusades in Great Britain many years ago, in the city of London, huge crowds were gathering to hear these two powerful men of God preach the word and hear the ministry that they carried on. But they got news. Moody got some news that greatly disturbed him he learned that the gypsy people were being restrained by the London bobbies, the London police, that they were not being allowed to attend the meetings because they were pickpockets and they might disrupt things and they certainly did not want a criminal element present. And so they were not allowing the gypsies to come to the meetings. Moody was greatly disturbed, shared the news with Sankey, and they made a decision that these people needed the gospel as much as any others and perhaps worse. And they chartered a carriage one evening and, and from the local livery and they went out to Epping Forest to conduct some meetings. There at Epping Forest, the gypsy people greeted them with great admiration. The little children gathered around them and they had seen the, the, the sketches on the cover of the London papers and uh, it, it was such a wonderful welcome and they preached and God moved and some were saved. It was a wonderful afternoon, evening there. And finally the time came for them as the sun was setting and they were going to leave and head back to the city. But before Moody could drive the carriage away, Ira Sankey looked and his eyes fell to glimpse on a little gypsy boy, a little brown-faced and dark-eyed gypsy boy along by the side of the carriage looking up with a longing face. Ira Sankey said, Brother Moody, if you'd hold up just a second. And he reached out and he placed his hand on the head of that little boy. And he said, oh God, if this little lad has never been born again and never been saved, will you save me by the marvelous grace of God through the blood of Calvary? And Lord, will you call him then to be a mighty preacher of the gospel? They went on that day and many years passed by. In Great Britain, there was an evangelist that was preaching to tens of thousands of people. The news came to America that he was doing this and that he was coming to America to hold crusades here in the United States. One of the first things the great evangelist did whenever he got off the boat was to seek out the home of Ira Sankey. 
He knocked on the door and Iris Sankey came, almost blind now with age. Moody already left and gone on home to be with the Lord. But Iris Sankey, a dim vision, he, he, he said, Brother Sankey, he said, I know you probably won't remember me. He said, but Brother Sankey, do you remember one day in Epping Forest when you and Moody came out and preached to the gypsy people and, and uh, we had such a wonderful time? Do you remember that? Do you remember a little brown-eyed gypsy boy? And he said, oh, I've forgotten many things, sir, in my age. And I've forgotten many people. But he said, I, I can certainly remember that day. And he said, I'll never forget the beautiful face of that gypsy boy and how God spoke my heart to pray for him that day. He said, Brother Sankey, my name is Evangelist Gypsy Smith, and I am that boy that you prayed for that day. Gypsy Smith was a powerful preacher. Preached with the power and unction of the Holy Spirit of God, and thousands were converted through his ministry. He's one of the old great evangelists. And one night, Gypsy Smith, at the age of 80 years old, years later, was preaching under the anointing of the Spirit of God. He was preaching with great power. And old Vance Hatter, another uh, great evangelist, young in those days, was sitting under the ministry of Gypsy Smith, listening to him preach and admiring his style, admiring the, style, the, the fervor that he preached with. Gypsy Smith preached that night and he said, with the fervor of a man 30 years old rather than 80 years old. Vance Havner, after the service, went to him and he introduced himself. He said, Brother Smith, he said, I could not help but be moved tonight by the preaching of the Word of God. He said, you preach not as a man of 80 years. You preach like a man of 30 years old. He said, I'm a young evangelist and I must know your secret. I want to know what keeps the, the Word of God fresh in your heart. I want to keep know what keeps the passion and the fire in your soul. I want to know why God keeps using you and blessing you. I want to understand those things. Oh, Gypsy Smith looked at him. He said, he said, I can tell you that, Brother Haver. He said, ever since the day that I first met the Lord Jesus as my Savior and called him Lord and Savior, ever since I came to know him years ago, I have never lost the wonder of it all. Old Al Smith heard that story and wrote the song, I have never lost the wonder of it all. I have never lost the wonder of it all. Since the day that Jesus saved me and a brand new life he gave me, I have never lost the wonder of it all. Amen. Can I tell you what's wrong with us in our day? We've lost the wonder. That's right. We've lost the wonder. Most of what we do for God is more routine than it is passion. We know what to do. We know the words to say. The things that we can do. The things that we shouldn't do. And we serve Him more by habit and routine than we do because of the great passion that burns within us. We've become so familiar with the great Christian doctrines that they're no longer great to us. We get accustomed to preaching and we're no longer moved and we do not visit the altar. And we do not we do not change. We simply come. We need to see the Lord Jesus Christ in his glory again. We need to see him something like Isaiah did when he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. We need to see him like John did whenever he said, whenever he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He must increase. I must decrease. Amen. But one thing further tonight as we, as we move forward, they question his authority. And because of his familiar association, but third and last tonight, because they doubted his ability. The reality was that Christ had the power to do anything that he might have desired to do that night, that day. He certainly would have done in Nazareth as much or more than he had done in other places. But with that reality came rejection from the people. Unbelief. They had no faith. Mighty works only happen in the lives of God's people whenever, whenever faith, man's faith, meets God's ability. Whenever those two things come together, 
In just about every miracle recorded, there is an inquiry into faith, or there is the suggestion or the indication that faith was present in every one of those things. And, and, and it is true that the preaching of the gospel has to be mixed with faith. A man can hear the gospel and understand the gospel, but according to Hebrews chapter 4, it must be mixed with faith to take effect. There must A man must place his faith and trust in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for him, else he will never be born again, only from hearing. And the walk of the believer is carried out in faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, the great the great hall, faith hall of fame and all of the things that were done. And these were ordinary people. People just like you and I. Things that, thing, people that, that had no, no particular claim to greatness and that came out of obscure backgrounds and yet God used them. And God worked great things through them and mighty works through their lives simply because of faith. And in verse 6 it reminds us Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. If you want to please God this morning, you've got to believe something about Him. If you want to please God today, you've got to believe something enough about Him to walk with Him and to obey Him and to learn to submit to the voice and conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life and to learn to forget about the world and comforts here and the things that will vanish away and one day be gone and realize that there are more eternal things to cling to. What do what you also remember this? There's a reaction that Jesus gave. He marveled. Only twice in the Word of God is it ever recorded that Jesus marveled. Once is in Luke chapter 7, and he marveled over the faith, the great faith of the Gentile centurion. But now in our text tonight, he marveled over the great unbelief of his own hometown. It is truly amazing what faith can do in the life of the child of God and what faith can do from those that turn to him by faith, come to Christ, and are born again. That's amazing. That's miraculous within itself. But understand something. It is equally amazing what the lack of faith can deprive you of. When Jesus left that day, I have no doubt from, from reading this, it, it, it just is inferred in every bit of it, that there were people that had needs, that, that maybe had children that needed help or that were unruly and could have gotten help or maybe demon-possessed or there were all kinds of things. There were families and marriages that needed help. There were people that needed help that day. People that were sick and people that had maladies that could have been healed, but yet it never happened because of unbelief. Jesus could have done things in their life. Their marriage could have been saved. Their family could have been helped. Their kids could have gotten better and gotten some help. Things that they dealt with and problems and hurts and, and, and sins of the past could have been dealt with. The guilt and the shame could have been erased and it was not. And even more dramatic is this, that in hell today, tonight, in hell there are people tonight that if we could find them and speak to them in that place of fire, that they would say, I was there. I heard he preached that day. I'm, a Naz I'm from Nazareth. That was my hometown. I grew up with him as a lad. I was familiar with him. I know him. I heard him. I would recognize his voice if I heard it again today. And I would not accept him. I would not let him have authority in my life. I would not give my heart and life to him. And I can help today because of unbelief. That's, right. That's amazing. <clears throat> that is absolutely amazing. I wonder tonight, I wonder tonight, first of all, if you've ever trusted him truly as your Savior. Yes, I know that this is a church, and in my, in my book, knowing 
knowing Brother Harley Sloppers I have and knowing your church and having attended here at different times when we're in town and preached to you before, I know the character and the quality of this church. And I know that probably most of you are saved, but I also know that Judas hid among those that were the disciples. There's a stranger, spiritually speaking, among them. And I know this, that maybe that tonight there could be someone here that really has just never really absolutely truly been born again. But even more, church, wouldn't you like to see God do some great things in your lives? Amen. As an individual, wouldn't you like to see God use you to build some pews and to bring the church to overflowing? Wouldn't you like to see revival break out in the main of our life? Wouldn't you like to see God use you? Say, preacher, I know somebody's lost. I got a son, a daughter, a man, an uncle, a, 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 a nephew. Preacher, I got people that I really care about that are lost. Wouldn't you like to see God do a great thing and use you and allow you to be the one to lead them to Christ? What do you want God to do in your walk, in your life, and in your church, believers, tonight? I wonder if you'd do something with me. I wonder if you'd stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And I wonder, I don't, I don't know how invitation, how you like invitation, if our brother would play something, play just a verse. Let me